Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So today we have a big honor to have Professor Suru Sha come to UST again to give all this will be excellent presentation. Uh, so you know the Professor Sha. Right now is uh, if we all we talk about the ranking, okay? If we ranking is the concrete technology, so he's on the top, probably number number one, right? So when I go out for the conference, when I go to USA and uh, Europe, so the people always introduce it like this. So Song Jin Li is the professor of students. When professor come to China, everybody introduced like this. Professor Sha is so needed advisor. <laughs> so you, you can see oh, all yeah, the relationship, right? So I do not see too many words, okay? Everyone knows the achievement of the Professor Sha. So today, he will go and talk on the, this is the video for the future development for the cement-based material. Now let's welcome Professor Sha. Wait until uh, it's uh, really for me. It's coming back uh, to home. As many of you know, I was here for what five five months uh, in uh, two years ago, and I I think since then I've come. So it's well. I'm very looking forward to spending some time here and hopefully interact um, with some of uh, Professor Lee's students. And while I was going through my slides and also looking at the program of Golden Research Conference, I find out that, in a way, what I'm going to present might be a preview of the various topics that are selected um, for Golden Research Conference. Obviously, the idea there what are the new research areas, what are the critical research areas. So that's what I'm going to uh, present today. Uh, and uh, let me see, you know, here wrong way. So the list of topics that I've selected, first, first three topics, rheology, pumping, rock fill concrete, are all dealing with the property of concrete as are finding out that that is really important area. What happens to concrete once you make first few minutes, first few hours, a tremendous difference to the performance of concrete. You know, not as much as we should. Then nanoparticles, a lot of people are working, and you will see at the GRC conference, Quite a few people will deal in nanoparticles. Some are with phase change materials, also carbon nanotube and graphene oxide. So I, and I'm going to talk about recycle aggregate, focus again on the nanoparticle. Some work on CNT and graphene. And finally, some interesting work, not of my own, but I thought it would be interesting to present energy efficient use of waste material. So that's the topic. So let's start with the rheology. I think many of you know that one of the latest development constructability of concrete self-consolidated. The idea is that it flows like water, and it does it without that is possible because we manipulate property of fresh concrete or rheology. So give you the understanding of, let's say, the history of concrete on the rate of hydration reaction measured by the heat of hydration. We're all familiar with this time history. So in the beginning, up to initial set, what are called rheology. Then, afterwards, people call early age properties. 
a lot of emphasis now on early age cracking, whether due to uh, shrinkage or temperature. And then we are talking about hardened concrete. Now, if you look at the literature, you find out that literature is inversely proportional timeline. There's a lot of understanding on strength, durability, transport property, very less on early age and even less on technology. And this is why I think that many people are currently working on rheology. Uh, what is important, many engineers consider what here I call stage two as a dormant period. But in fact, far from dormant, many things are happening. Uh, there are uh, changes in fluid chemistry, ionic concentration. What we have to understand when we talk about rheology. Now, one very important thing that people don't often appreciate is that what is happening during that time is essentially happening. For example, we use plasticizers to make concrete more fluid, more workable, and transportable. And for plasticizers are supposed, people say they're adsorbed and particle. But in fact, if you look closely, they're adsorbed on a tringite. And if you look at the scale, I've shown the cement particle scale, and then I've also shown the scale of uh, a tringite, CSH, and polymer particle. So actually the reaction between these two among this particle is the key thing of what is happening early age in rheology, in uh, compatibility between cement and admission, and this is what we have to uh, study. So there are many aspects of rheology, Still stress, viscosity, the one that I want to talk about and one we have been working on is thixotropy. What is thixotropy? Well, when you apply a shear rate, capacity of this material a thixotropic decrease. And when they are at rest, when you stop pumping, capacity comes back for provided, of course, there are no chemical changes. Now, thixotropy is very important in many applications. Very important, for example, if you are spraying or short creating concrete. Very important in finishing. Very important in formwork pressure. And sleep cast paving. Also becoming quite important in oil well cement. So very important for us to know how to measure thixotropy, and how to manipulate it. Uh, we have been Thixotropy application where we want to increase the exotropy. We want to make material at rest, their uh, strength, as it were, uh, faster. So what I want to show is some work we are doing on studying exotropy at meso, micro, and at nano. So, and as I mentioned, one of is we have found that we can manipulate thixotropy by adding all amount of <clears throat> nanoparticle. Uh, these are commercially called actigel, and they are uh, aluminosis. What they are is you have a cells, they are calcined, and they are exfoliated, and so they are at the stable uh, at nanoscale. So just to show you. One way isotropy can be manipulated by nanoclay is homework pressure. So if you look at the uh, picture at your right, we have a pressure vessel which we fill up with concrete, apply the vertical pressure, and depending upon the amount of vertical pressure, also measure lateral. Horizontal pressure is homework pressure. 
often people also call shuttering. So what is plotted on your left is this pressure versus time after casting. And we are talking about a couple of hours. If you look at the top curve, and maybe it's better to show it here, the top curve is vertical applied pressure. That's it. You are building a structure element at different uh, stages, casting. Now, if the material was water, then vertical and horizontal pressure would be the same. Static. But this is an SCC, which is a sum flow about 60. And you can see that they are not the same. Because and concrete are thixotropic. However, when we add 0.3% of nanoclay, homework pressure is substantially reduced. In other words, we have increased this rate of structural rebuilding when the material is at rest. So that's one of the uh, consequences of manipulating thixotropy. Now, how do you measure this thixotropy? So to explain the device that we have come up with, I have this cartoon of what thixotropy means. If you look at the, you have pumping concrete, then if you stop pumping and material is like water, then it will flow out. But here, oh, I guess we have to go back again. It went too fast, huh? If you look at the material to your right, it doesn't flow out because it's tropic. Just as like when you cut it, if the blood was like water, it will continue to flow, but it doesn't. So to simulate this, what we have done is we have this parallel plate rheometer, and we first applied a constant shear rate. That's pumping. Then we switched it apply constant shear stress on this less than the yield stress and see how long it takes for the rate to drop to zero. And I will show you uh, an example of what we observe. So this is the cement paste. So this is the decay time under constant shear rate, time it requires. And then when we have added this small amount of nano clay, you can see time is order of magnitude. So this is a very good way of uh, measuring isotropy. Obviously, in, as I said, how it changes with the cement chemistry, with admixtures, uh, it could be a very good way. Another interesting work that we are doing, and actually this is, I don't know, some of you, I don't know whether you know Professor Lee J. Hong Kim. He did work at Northwestern now. So he uh, bought this equipment a few years ago, and, and what it is, it's a parallel plate rheometer, but here it has a window here, and through the window the laser light, focus laser beam is shown, and what you measure here is a backscatter light, so you measure cord length. So the idea is that what is thixotropy is that flocule develop, and when then flocule percolate, then you transfer the stresses, so you don't have the uh, pore water pressure. So we are measuring this cord length, and the size that you can measure is changing from as small as half a micron uh, to 1.2 millimeter. That's sufficient for our purpose. So let me show you uh, some of the results. See, what is plotted here is that you are rotating between the two plates at a given speed. The top one at a very small, slow speed, as if the material is at rest, and bottom is at fast rate. Then you are measuring how many particles are of a particular size. So you get a frequency distribution. And you notice that at very slow speed on the top, with time, so you measure after mixing, two minutes, 
every minute, this thing is continued to rotate, and you see con things are moving to the right. That's exotropy. The size of the flocule. The other end on the bottom, it's very high speed. So material becomes more flowable, and so the things are moving left. Here, we can measure the size of the flocule from the code length. But because this is a rheometer, you can also measure the viscosity. So the left or the slow speed and high speed, I've shown the viscosity versus time. And knowing those particle size distribution that I showed, and then using the particle packing concept, you can calculate packing density. And you can see that the packing density increases very slow speed. That is why we have this uh, good relation between uh, packing density and uh, maximum packing as given by Peter Doty. This is, a, again, a very powerful tool to evaluate influences of what happens when you have a different cement chemistry that makes it. Now, so that's at the micro level. Earlier, we talked about the meso level. But now the flocule, why the cement particles are attracted or, uh, or they are uh, repelled, obviously depends upon the, the, the strength of the flocule, and depends upon the electrostatic forces and van der Waal forces. Now, can we measure this? And we have started doing this. This is work actually done at Iowa State by uh, K. G. Wang. And any of you are familiar with atomic force microscopy. So as you know, the atomic force microscopy has this cantilever. And what you do when you move the cantilever up and down, you can measure the forces between, essentially, at the molecular level. And I, that's what, uh, so what we want to do. Or let's say, for example, people have started doing it with particle between ESH, or plasticizer, so, or particles between um, a clinker. So here, for a, so you make a, a plate. Here I have shown two cases. In one case, you have a repulsive forces which dominate, where you have a super plasticizer. And here, you have a strong attraction. So this we have just started, but this gives model to build up of. And if you are familiar with some of the work that uh, done at, uh, uh, now he's at uh, Zurich. They're measuring, he's assuming what is the Hamaker constant and the forces. But now we have a method of measuring this at nanoscale. So that was some work on rheology. Now, I mentioned one of the interesting and important application of this is in pumping. One of the advantage of HCC, you can pump concrete like fluid. And when you make a very super tall building, faster you pump, more economic the construction. That is really the key. So for example, currently the world tallest building, Burj Khalifa, will have pumped to 600 meters. Next one is going to be in Saudi Arabia, and they want to pump one kilometer. Pumping concrete is absolutely necessary for economic construction. In fact, in Burj Khalifa, the last 100 uh, meter is made out of steel. And that is a steel structure was fabricated in the bottom and lifted. And that is much more expensive than the rest of the out of concrete. So pumping key to economic success of super tall building. Pumping is also important in tunneling and horizontal construction. For example, in cities like Hong Kong, where ready mixed truck cannot travel freely, you make concrete at one side and pump 
really a kilometer long. So to be able to pump economically obviously involves understanding of rheology and manipulating it. In particular, when you pump, what, find, what turns out is that it's a plug flow and there is a slip layer. Slip layer is a lower yield stress and viscosity than the bulk. If you can manipulate that, you can pump at a lower pressure. So this is what some of the people are doing. And I thought some interesting work done, again, by a, uh, somebody, Kwan in Korea, uh, he was also at Northwestern. So he's measuring the rheological properties of the bulk and the slip layer. And he has developed a very interesting model to calculate the movement of aggregates. Aggregates move from high rate of shear that is near the pipe of pump towards the center. And based on this, it then calculates what are the, uh, uh, what is the, con you know, knowing the concentration of particle, you can calculate the, uh, uh, the viscosity gradient and velocity gradient. And based on that model, also done a verification test. In fact, he is working with these three different construction companies, Samsung, Lotte, and Honda. And so these are horizontal construction. And then, as you can see, that he has he compares, predicted, uh, measured uh, pressure, and a very good. This is the kind of work many people are now working. The idea is, can we pump longer? and higher distance by manipulating rheology so you can do it at the lower pressure. So that's one example of importance of rheology. The third example I want to give importance of is in rock-filled concrete. Many of you are familiar that this is the type of construction uh, developed at Tsinghua University. Uh, I had a, a student from there who spent time at Northwestern. And if you are not familiar with the construction, I don't know what happened to me. Uh, oh, here we go. So you have a, a big boulders of rock. You fill them up and then have HCC that goes between those boulders. And then you have a solid construction. This requires less cement than other method of construction of dams, so it's environmentally friendly. And there are 40 projects in China where they have used. So the student who came to Northwest and he wanted to see what is the relation between the size of these boulders and the geology of HCC. So he, he, uh, the, there are many issues involved here. And I just want to uh, show you this one thing that what we did, we developed this uh, model where we use instead of HCC concrete, it was HCC mortar. And you can see you, f you, you fill it up here, the keeping the, this height, this thickness is less than the height, so you maintain the height is constant. And then we measured how these pores are filled what is the porosity at different points. And one of the concerns they had, that in normal concrete, larger the size of the aggregate, poorer the interface. Now here we are talking about big boulders. So what about the interface? So we also measured that. And I want to show you some results. That here it finds out, here for example, the filling capacity, and these are three different sizes. And larger the aggregate, better the filling capacity. And in fact, then we measured the cutting the cross section and then using SCM and the gray level analysis, the interfaces, the distance and the porosity. And this is the larger size, and that's a smaller size. So contrary to conventional casting, here, the larger size, the denser the aggregate. Because 
here for the SCCT uh, go through. So this is another example where rheology and practical construction uh, joins in. So the first three parts that I talked about, as I said, deal, dealt with property of concrete as a liquid. And there are a lot of things I did not talk about. For example, both for pumping, people are using fluid dynamics modeling, a lot of work being done. How you model it, if you do the computer program like Fluent, that are for homogeneous material. How do you include the aggregate? So there are some very interesting, challenging modeling issues involved both for the rock field concrete as well as for as well as for pumping. Now, many people are working, as I said, on nanoparticles. I want to talk about some work we have done where we use nanoparticle to accelerate hydration and tension amount of cement is replaced with tires. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, yeah, no. Yeah. No, and it's it very important, very interesting that this type of construction is not necessarily new. About, uh, about I would say, early 19th century, there were houses built in Evanston where the walls of the building were this outfill and they are solid. So you have an not boulder but large aggregate and mortar is grouted. So this is a very and certainly they have shown here that it's a very advantageous and to talk about saving in cement, we know we can re, should replace with fly ash and there are many advantages, but one of the disadvantages that rate of construction should if rate of construction slows down, which is not really uh, compatible with the modern need, we want to accelerate the hydration of dry ash. There are many ways to do it. Many people are working on geopolymer, which is alkali activated. And I know that Professor Hongzin Lee's group is also working on that. I want to talk about whether we can accelerate it with nanoparticles. We've done work with nano limestone and nano silica. I'm just going to present the work that we have done on nano silica. So if you look at the right, by the way, I realize I don't know how that happened, but the label, what it is, is that uh, this is the set and final set uh, measured by Vic. 40% uh, of the cement is required. And this, actually, the label is wrong. This is no addition of colloidal nanosilica. It's 2.5%, 5% of colloidal nanosilica. Colloidal nanosilica because nanosilica is already this. Addition of nanosilica accelerate. Also found same thing. With other nanoparticles too. Uh, with nanosilica, how it accelerates is of interest, and I want to talk about that. And to first, you can see the impressive strength seven day versus 90 days. And this is true and the same as I showed before. So when you have higher the amount of nanosilica, higher the early strength, which is expected. But what is interesting that the final strength may be even slightly lower. This may not be that significant as far as structural design is concerned, but certainly we have to understand why. So this work that went Pancun, now at 
Nan University was at Northwestern. So this is an SCM picture of a fly ash particle surrounded by ESH in a, without any nanosilica and with nanosilica. You can see here the surface is quite rough. Here the fly ash surface is not only smooth, but there is a coating. And that coating has a lower calcium a very dense coating. So this dense coating means that later on, ash cannot react with hydroxide. So then it acts a filler material. And that is why it doesn't, might even have a somewhat lower strength at the early age. So with nanosilica, we have identified three effects as far as the hydration kinetics. Seeding effect, ozolanic effect that we already know, and then of course this coating effect has to be uh, included when you are uh, analyzing the effect of nano. Now, nano silica, of course, also influences long term property. And this is the work that I'm presenting. It was done in Spain, uh, by the group called Labain. And what their interest is in calcium leaching. You know that calcium leaching is very important in long-term applications of concrete for many things such as storage of uh, hazardous waste. So this is the strength. This is plain cement paste, no addition, seven day strength, 28 day strength, and 16 days of accelerated calcium leaching can see strength drops, calcium leaching. Now here we have a 6% of silica fume or micro silica. Certainly compared to plain cement, you have a higher 28 day strength. Strength drop. But in the middle, same amount of nano silica. And you notice that the degradation, much less certainly compared to plain cement, but also compared to so, nano silica, although the both are silica chemically, nano silica reacts differently than micro silica. And we'll come back to that a little later on. Another interesting application of nano silica, and I presented this because I know that Professor Lee is quite a bit interested in coating. This is also work done at Jinan, and we just presented it at Purdue. And this is, if you, you know, a lot of the problem occurs at the surface of concrete structure. If you have a deteriorated concrete structure, how do you repair it? Well, one way is to have the solution of nano silica. Now, how do you do it? So, what you do use this. Uh, Teos, which is a precursor of nanosilica. And Teos, when it hydrolyzes, you have a nanosilica. And this he has shown here as a Teos in calcium hydroxide. Presence of calcium, Teos hydrolyzes, and you have nanosilica deposited, poor. So what I'm going to show you are the, some samples that he had cast and dried, then soaked in either water, plain water, or water with In the next slide, you can see this is the water absorption of the surface. Clearly, when you have a Teos, water absorption goes. Now, the nano silica that is deposited certainly will go into the pore as a filler, but it will also act as a pozzolanic material. And to show that, I did some XRD. And I don't know whether you can see it, but uh, calcium hydroxide on when it was with. Uh, he also did some cal uh, uh, calcium leaching. And also, this is when it was uh, Teos treated. Nanosilica, just as we saw in the 
this bar of work. Now, the question is, we have to, what happens at the nanoscale with, for example, with nanosilica? So there are many ways to look at it, both at Jinan and at, uh, oh, they did NMR, and, and, and at uh, and they did IR. They found that the chain length of silica, silicate is longer when it is uh, when, uh, with nano silica. We are working uh, the effect of uh, nano structure. And I know some of you are working with this nano index. Uh, the one we are using is this um, histeron ribo indenter, and the advantage there is that you can look where you are indenting. That, of course, helps quite a bit. So, for example, some of you are, are already familiar with this. This is 60 micron by 60 micron. FM picture, this is a, a unhydrated cement surrounded by CSH. This is where we decided to indent. And when you can measure modulus, Young's modulus from the contact mechanics, and these are the values. So that you notice that the CSH doesn't have a single modulus. People have speculated many things related to as particle packing of um, nanospheres. But one way to represent the modulus of CHS is, is the frequency plot. Uh, this is the work done by initially by Hans Ulm. So if you plot probability versus modulus, and without any nanosilica, it's here. This is the CSH. But when we add nanosilica, right? So this material has become material has addition of nanosilica has changed the nanostructure of CSH is measured by the mechanical property as well as by NMR and by uh, IR spectra. So that I thought was a uh, interesting uh, finding. And we'll see some papers. Now, I want to continue with this nano indentation. Because characterization using the tool available, it's certainly one of the important area of research. And when you do a nano indentation, what you find out that the indent lies in micron. So what you are really measuring is an average property at the nanoscale, even in nano indentation. So how you get around it? So there are two ways, and this was the work done by uh, uh, Wang Yi. I don't know whether you met him. He was at Songji, and now he's teaching at Hunan. You met him. I think he said you met him. So what he did, he compared the results, and I won't go into detail, the paper will just will be out. And then another way is you use the same setup, but instead of applying static force, you apply a very small dynamic force. So the amount of force is 100 times less, and you measure then the complex modulus. And you can, and also the frequency. The spacing much, much closer. That's called quantitative modulus mapping. And then a third way, you have an AFM, then you can use it, and it's called peak force method. And the idea is that, you know, AFM, I mentioned earlier, is what you do, you have a very sensitive, flexible cantilever. It goes over the surface. Now, or if you want accuracy at the nanoscale, this has to be very, very flexible. And you measure the deflection with photodiode. Now, if you are doing something on biofilm, then you can use this deflection also to calculate the modulus. But with cement, you cannot. So you change the uh, stiffness 
of the use depending upon what material and that way you can get also a very good result. So here we have compared all three methods on the identical specimen. I thought that one area of uh, really use this have at the nano level to understand. Uh, I, as I said, I didn't talk about other nanoparticles, but I thought it would be interesting to mention some work we are doing on bohemite, which is a nano alumina. Uh, just look at this. Uh, this is a one day strength. Uh, this is a one day strength of uh, and without any addition. And if you look at this one, it's almost double. And when you have 2% of nanosilica, 0.25% of nano alumina. Now clearly, you have to understand, and now we are doing it, nano alumina accelerates not by accelerating age formation. What is changes? calcium alumino carbonate and also cash calcium alumino uh, uh, silica hydrate. So each nanoparticle obviously acts differently than just plain seeding, as I mentioned to you in uh, silica. And to better understand it, we have just started to use this tool, which is called atomic probe tomography. And we start with in using field ion microscope, a conical specimen. We start with a clinker, and then by removing iron, by field iron, you get this kind of shape, put it there, and we put a, a, a particle on whatever we are studying, this case calcium. Uh, 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 nano calcium carbonate, and then uh, from that, the sample is ionized atom by atom, and you get a 3D picture of the happening. At the a very powerful tool. Uh, Northwestern is one of the few universities has this, even to, it's, it's obviously quite expensive, but this is very important to get nanoscale and what's happening. Uh, so that's some idea on nanoparticle. Now I want to talk about recycled aggregates. In, if you know that there is a, actually in this, uh, like, I mean, China, India, Hong Kong, and everywhere, we have this correlation waste. Correlation could be natural or could be uh, because of the disaster. So we want to use the recycle aggregate. People are using recycle aggregate for the sub-base, still not for structural concrete. Because what happens is that recycle aggregate has two interfaces. So you have a natural aggregate and the old mortar, as it were, and that's one interface. And then when you cast it, you have a new mortar, and another interface. This interface is weak. This is why the strength is lower. So people are saying, can we modify it? And the approach, for example, one approach is carbonation. Professor C.H. Poon at uh, Hong Kong Poly is, that, that is you know, carbonating the surface. Uh, in, uh, Singapore, they're microwaving it to remove that old mortar. Harry Ong is doing that. And, uh, some people in India are applying heat to that old mortar. We have started a project jointly with Zhejiang uh, University, Hangzhou, that can we modify the surface with dipping it in nano silica and no limestone. So the, the, I want to present some results of that work here. Uh, so here, if you look at it, we 
have this recycled aggregate. This is a natural aggregate. We are talking about water absorption of aggregate. And this is a recycled aggregate. You can see its absorption is quite high. This is known. Now, these two are treated. This one is treated by slurry containing nanosilica and nanocalcium carbonate, while this one is treated by slurry containing cement and nanosilica. So you can see that although absorption is not quite as low as natural aggregate, it's substantially lower than uh, untreated aggregate. And measured also the chloride diffusion coefficient, and these are two are treated are close to natural aggregate. This is obviously concrete made with these two aggregates. Uh, and then, uh, so there are certainly, it seems to be the treatment works also, as far, I didn't show you as far as compressive strength and other properties of concrete, almost as good as natural aggregate. And to see what this treatment that's to interface. So you see, you have here the old mortar and the new mortar, and in between, we have this, we call it new. And if you, we are measuring using the nano indentation, the grid is shown uh, in the left bottom. And so I'm going to show you the results at this part, and this is the probability versus modulus. So you can see this is the untreated interface of untreated recycled new and then after treatment and you can see the right. So treatment did uh, improve the interfaces and that was one of the cons why we saw um, water absorption and aggregate and crude compressive strength concrete made. So that was some work, and as I said, it's not uh, still going, so we have not finished it. So now I want to talk about, um, let me see, the, so the title, I call it CNT and graphene. Um, and I know that there's going to be some work presented at both for CNT and graphene day after tomorrow or Monday. So I think this work I had presented here before, but just to remind you, these are the multi-wall carbon nanotubes. And they are dispersed using ultrasonication and surfactant. So you can see single multi-wall carbon nanotube. And when you have this well-dispersed multi-wall carbon nanotube in cement, what does it do? So first I want to show you in terms of nanostructure, nanomechanical properties. So here, this is the familiar probability versus elastic modulus. Cement paste with water to cement ratio 0.5. This is cement paste with multi-wall carbon nanotube 0.08 percent. Very, very small amount. And just as we saw in nanosilica, it has moved to the right. It's this. So as a result of this, as far as performance is concerned, the fracture property, some work done at the University of South Carolina, this is classical fracture test where you measure load versus crack mouth open. So this is plain cement, and this red one is 0.05% of nanotube. Very small amount, a substantial increase in modulus, substantial increase in fracture strength, and also toughness. This is carbon nanotube work. There will be more discussion next week on that. And, I, and then we also saw not only improvement in mechanical property, but also on transport property is manifested with autogenous shrink. This autogenous shrinkage of low water to cement ratio of cement paste, and this is with 0.0, .0 
percent of money, substantial reduction. People are also talking about using this material as a smart material, using it as a piezo resistance, and this is um, already work on the same concept in the sensor. Here it's made all amount here in this case 0.1 percent of um, so um, then I saw some very interesting work affin oxide I don't know how much how many of you are familiar with this pervious concrete you know pervious concrete is concrete it's made with upgraded if you will so the water flows through or Pavement. When if the pavement is solid, the water then runs off and doesn't go into the soil. Here the water goes back to the soil, goes back to the water table, and it's also somewhat purified. So people are now saying that can we use this for filtration? You know, and especially in many parts of the country. Water purification, big issue. So if you have this, need to make pervious concrete, use this as a filter. For example, here, the water was polluted with bentonite in the laboratory. And what they found out that turbidity, when the water went measured before and after, 950 before, and you see turbidity went down. And down, but they found that pH increase. Not a good idea uh, for purification. So what? Second step for using filtration: accelerated carbonate sample. So then the pH also went down. This is the pH acceptable for drinking water. Have the Pervious concrete, accelerate the carbonation, then you can use it. But then another idea is that if you have affine in the cement, affine oxide in the cement, and the idea came, this was, I was, this work start, had started when I was visiting IIT Madras in India. So we're talking with the chemistry people, and they, here is a coke. And when it goes to graphene oxide filter, it comes out, dye is gone, filtered through. So what the idea is that you have a graphene in the cement, pervious concrete, so that it acts. Remember that normally the filter has three stages, primary, secondary, and tertiary. And do it all in one with this. micro graphene, so this is meant to be but this is a graphene oxide. So I thought this is a very interesting uh, uh, area of research. And then I want to present a couple of work I found intriguing using waste material, but considering making sure that the, when you are using waste material and Improving it, the energy balance is favorable. One of the waste material, as many of you know, is called biomass. You know, you have a lot of waste material. Many people are from the Raisas. Whole issue, and one of them is this bagasse ash. And bagasse produced in different parts of the world is shown here quite a bit, also in China and India. And what it is, after you remove the sugar, then they use that as a fuel. And then, so you have this ash and substantial amount. So can you use that and replace it? What, this is a, what the group of Manu did. The first you did one idea is to see at a different temperature how can you make it pozzolanic? The pozzolanic is made by the ASTM index. You know, you replace percent of cement with 
Ash and see how it is compared in comparison. 100% would be like your cement. So 75% is the limit. And you can see that you probably 700 degree Celsius seems to be ideal. In this case, because higher temperature, and you have more crystallite, which is not good for pozzolanic activity. And uh, lower temperature, probably not enough carbon is gone, so they pick 700. You are going to burn the ash, heat it to 700 degrees for maximum pozzolanic activity. So to heat it. Now, can you improve it by grinding? We know grind. So if you grind it at the same level as cement grinders, then yes, it is increased from here. About 90% of pozzolanic activity. Burning, heating, and grinding. However, they found out that if you take this ash, move the fibrous part by sieving, and then just grind it at 106%. This is energy-wise the most efficient. Don't have to heat it. Heating, of course, doesn't have some energy. So I thought that this kind of approach, where you must balance the energy of uh, using waste material. Another, oh, and then they did with this, heaved and ground test of concrete. And for example, here you can see, right? Very, very low. And this uh, gas ash. Uh, another quite interesting work. There's a lot of waste material lime sludge. Many can require lime, and so you have a lime sludge. And substantial amount is primarily calcium carbonate. So one idea is to you calcine it. Here they took the lime and used it, lime, calcium carbonate, and, and then they added nano silica. See what happens. So there are two approaches. One is take lime sludge, add nano silica, and heat and heating it, so you have a solid state reaction. No calcining, because no calcining means no carbon dioxide. And what they got is, and this C2S, uh, you know, it depends, as you can see, on the temperature. You get lower temperature, you have less than This temperature you have. Right. Now, they have not done work not done, whether the light from this way, how different it is, conventional be light, as far as the rate of reaction and rate of hydration. But I thought it was very interesting. They can also form be light by calcining and grinding. This is mechanochemical grinding. So if you look from XRD, a different amount of grinding changes. So the best B is be light was about 103 hours or 180 minutes. Also got C2S. Here, it's uh, calcining. So the reason I'm showing that, that these are approaches where people are now looking at you know, how can we reduce end content by using different waste material and carefully balancing the energy, carefully analyzing. Now, they will go step by step and see uh, what uh, this be like compared to the with the solid state reaction of calcium carbonate and a nano silica. OK, so I think I want to conclude now. And what I want to say is that what our focus is really is to how now you can satisfy the need for infrastructure everywhere. Uh, we need more and more concrete, but we use 
energy efficient way. So there are many ways. Some of them we mentioned use lead cement, prolonged service life, develop ultra high performance concrete. I didn't talk about it. And I don't know next week, we don't have too much on ultra high performance concrete, right? No. So I just, but, and then I talk a little bit about multifunctional material. I think we have a next week some talk on the phase chain material. And then I don't know, but we won't talk next week. But that's also important. When you are developing new materials, you must consider life cycle costs, how it balances out. So I hope that this gave you some idea of some of the current areas of research. Thank you. in the cement and the concrete research. And uh, this information is uh, very, very useful for our uh, the current research and the future research. Now, I believe you have something you wanted to get uh, more, you see, the answer from uh, Professor Shah. And, uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Actually, I have a question that kind of goes into one of the directions you're talking about next week, probably, but I'm not going to be at the conference, so I'll ask you now. So, I've always been really interested in the modified flexibility properties of concrete when you make it really thin and with fine wires like ferrosmite. You can pair some with rebar concrete for making the boat parts, for example. Uh, what is it about the interface between the cement and the, and the fine wire that gives it such flexibility that you don't see in rebar concrete? Well, you know, that's a good point. With ferrocement, it was the wire mesh cement, and it was started um, by Nervi, Pierre Luigi Nervi. He built boats and shells, and, and though he was not, did not do every such as we did, but he said what it does, it distributes the cracks. So higher the surface area, finer and finer cracks. Now we are using this concept in, let's say, small diameter fibers. Well, now are working on textile reinforce. Textile could be glass, carbon. Professor Chris Lang is doing quite a bit of work on this. The idea is that, and little material, but once it cracks, then if you have something to arrest that cracks, if that bond is such that the crack just a little bit, but not, so then it distributes it. And people, we have found out that if there, for a 50 millimeter thick concrete, cracks are less than 50 micron wide, then it's an impermeable. That's the idea. Are much, much more complicated. Put. Yeah. And so the idea then, going f one step down, is can we do something at the nano scale? We have successfully done it at macro scale, rebar, micro scale, which are fibers and wire mesh. Next step is nano level. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you very much for your talk. I have two questions. One is, uh, you mentioned uh, the relation of uh, nano-alumina. As we all know, uh, alumina is a very sheer thickening, sheer, it has sheer thickening properties. So if, uh, what is the effect of uh, utilization of nano-alumina on rheology? Let's, uh, first of all, you have to read. It's a very important point. You know, when you add nanoparticles, uh, because they have a large surface area, right? Uh, rheology becomes very important. And the trick is you add little as possible. So as you show, 0.25% of nano is on cement. But certainly, rheology this is also important with ma many other nanoparticles. And so you can balance that with use of plasticizer. 
particle packing and maximum. Uh, you know, often I don't remember, but I think it's something like five nanometers. I didn't? I'm sorry, I didn't. This is the one we have used are bohemite, nano bohemite. Yeah, yeah. right. The same thing. I think there are, the, another thing is you, it has to be in a small suspense. That's also a key, because you're going to transport it from Hong Kong to uh, Nanjing or wherever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. At the work I, one I presented was at uh, and Well, it's in the, the, this is the precursor of in water. I don't know, I, I don't know yet, at the, you know, this is the beginning, how far does it go? It doesn't have to go very far, but even a few millimeters. Fine. But how far does it go? You know, it depends. So most of the work you need to start with, with high water to cement ratio, so it will work. So of course we are using 0.2 water to cement ratio. May not work as well. But so that's a very good how how deep it will go. So this was the specimen but dried, that also helps. Type the water in. But those are the issues. You rightly pointed you, out. Is it necessary to apply any uh, electrical field to mm -hmm. drive it further? You mean the electrical field? Yeah. Use the use the the anode and yeah to drive it further. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, yeah. That's what we do when we remove chloride ion. I like cathodic around. Yeah, definitely. Oh, uh, yeah. That's, uh, okay, yeah, go ahead, and then you go back. On? Because it, even if you uh, use it for the coating or if you use it in the concrete, so because of the agglomeration and the flocculation, it becomes very difficult uh, that the properties are uh, homogeneous in, in all directions. So what do you suggest that what possible measures can be taken for to avoid this uh, agglomeration? Or you have to have just even with micro silica, right? Not, if they're not dispersed, they can cause more problem, such as ASR. So they have to be well dispersed. So here all for nano silica, we are using a colloidal nano silica. So it's, uh, you know, it does not have a stable suspension. Same thing when we see LG, carbon nanotube. Same thing we did with the nano. Nine. It has to be. That's very important. And you have another one? <laughs> Thank you. And uh, my second question, maybe maybe out of scope of this presentation. Uh, somebody else can answer it. <laughs> Although you didn't mention, but uh, um, nowadays uh, in, in China, in Australia, and Europe, huge amount of people are researching the uh, alkali activated flash, uh, activated slag, like that. Yeah. So I really want to know what's your opinion about the <laughs> perspective of uh, the geopolymers. Yeah, I know, but Professor Lee might have. Yeah, I was a uh, conference in Australia, and there is a lot of concern about this alkali activated bag. Uh, some of the alkali, if it's 
not reactive, then later on can cause durability problem. But shrinkage is an issue. What I found out uh, that most of the work with ASR, they have not really studied what happens to the microstructure. Only, person, only place where I know are doing good work is at Nanjing at Southeast University. And she, uh, Dame calls it not geopolymer, but alkali activated plant. And they are studying carefully what is the relation between microstructure and the properties of this. Only when we do that, then we will know whether it, you know, or not. But you, uh, you might have some more on yeah. is the yeah. issue. But also not too, you know, the work, I was saying they don't really, have not studied no, not how it changes the microstructure. I asked them why there is shrinkage is high. And they, oh. Thanks for your presentation. So uh, I have three questions. So first one, uh, you talk about the uh, multi walls in teeth. Right? Multi walls in teeth. Multi walls in carbon nanotubes. Car carbon nanotube, yeah, multi wall, multi wall, yes. Yeah. yeah, I. That was not my work, but many people have. This was work done by South Carolina. So uh, I want to know any special reason for the acid etched carbon nanotubes. Because actually there's a lot of carbon nanotubes. Why they choose the acid etched? Uh, is that uh, for the hydrophilic reason? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, if, if we use the acid etched uh, CNTs, so how about the, the, the electricity, electrical conductivity? It will be great, greatly reduced or not? I don't know. I don't think they have measured it. We are dispersing uh, by using surfactant and sonic agent for conductivity. Just for the, for the dispersion and the yeah. uh, Second question uh, is about graphene. You talk about the graphene, graphene oxide. oxide. Uh, graphene oxide. So uh, I want to know for the for the water filtration, uh, is the graphene or the graphene oxide? Graphene oxide. Graphene oxide. Right. Uh, so uh, do you think it, it's possible to mix the graphene oxide with cement together for the water filtration? That's what we are. So they, they, we have already made. They have already made cement with graphene oxide. Let's state the property separately, and they will with the. So the graphene oxide, okay, we do not need to graphene. Graphene no, oxide. Graphene oxide. oxide. So uh, the last one uh, is about the, the coating. You talk about the nano silica coating. So I want to know what kind of technology you have used for the for the coating. Just brush it or the. Yeah. No, it was it's a, the, the the specimen. Take the specimen, cure it, dry it, and soak it in the water or plain water. The control specimen or water with uh, there was a durability conference for Purdue University last week. All the, the proceedings are available online. This paper is there, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Sherman. So with the graphene oxide coming in water, embedded concrete for filtration, taking the dye E150A or whatever it is out of the Coca-Cola. That was not with cement. That was a different the idea we, that if it works with Coke, can it work? This was not. I know, I know. Yeah. It works with Coke or anything else that has that kind of color in it. It's probably going to have a capacity issue, right? I mean, are they thinking about regenerating? That's right. And what happens second and third? Well, this is always the problem when you use carbon as filtration. Right. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> so, so that's right. <laughs> you are absolutely right. But you know, let's see. First, see. Good first, exactly. <laughs> Good 
No, okay. Oh, one last. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, Professor Shah. Thank you for your impressive speech. Uh, I remember I've read one of your paper which focus on the hybrid fiber ring yes. uh, concrete. Actually, uh, we try to use some uh, different type of fiber to try to have uh, some positive synergetic effect, right? So, do you have any comments in this field? Any comments? You know, the, uh, the, what talking about that one designing structure for macroscopic ductility and in fibers certain you also want fibers to be lower permeability and mine fibers which are good for for let's say for reducing crack width and lower permeability of fibers as closely spaced as possible. Short fiber with small diameter for long, large scale ductility, longer fiber. So that was one way of combining. There are probably other ideas depending upon what performance. But, I mean, I know you are working for improving ability with. Uh, yeah high performance. Thank you.